If it's already discounting that, if it's selling at a huge multiple, you say, it's already, it has to work, and then it's only going to stay even. So you have to say to yourself, if I'm right, how much am I going to make? If I'm wrong, how much am I going to lose? You've seen these companies doing very well. You should have bought those instead of trying to buy biotechnology stocks exactly. you know nothing about. Peter Lynch gilt als der erfolgreichste Fondsmanager aller Zeiten. In seiner nur 13-jährigen Karriere schaffte er mit seinem Fonds eine jährliche Rendite von über 29%. Über 13 Jahre bedeutet das, 1 Dollar wäre auf 28 Dollar angewachsen und 100.000 Euro auf über 2,8 Millionen. Im Jahr 1997, als das folgende Interview mit Peter Lynch aufgenommen wurde, standen die Aktienmärkte am Allzeithoch. Ähnlich wie heute stiegen damals die Märkte unglaublich schnell an und schienen extrem überbewertet. Im folgenden Video erklärt Peter Lynch, wie er in einer solchen Phase investiert und worauf er achtet, um kein Geld zu verlieren. Viel Spaß beim Video. Lynch is highly regarded as one of Wall Street's legendary money managers. He ran Fidelity's Magellan Fund from 77 to 90. At the end of his 13-year helm, it was up over 2,700% and had become the world's largest mutual fund. He remains on the board of trustees at the Fidelity Group and is vice chairman of Fidelity Management and Research. His new <laughs> CD-ROM uh, is called The Stock Shop with Peter Lynch and its strategies to invest in the stock market with confidence. All the profits for this go to charity, I think. He joins me now to talk about the remarkable record volume day on Wall Street and other matters of investing, and I am very pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome back. Hey, Charlie, good to see you. It's smart of me, smart of me to schedule <laughs> you ago, on a day like this. Three months ago, I said, when do you want Lynch to come in? Right. I said, let's get him on Tuesday. Something's going to happen in the market that week, and so here we are. Glad to be here. Explain to me what's going on. Well, we had a huge run. I mean, the market was 4,000 just you know, two and a half years ago, yeah. and it ran up to 8,300 in August. Um hier kurz den Zusammenhang herzustellen, das Interview mit Peter Lynch wurde am 28. Oktober 1997 geführt und im Oktober stürzte der amerikanische Aktienindex Dow Jones von 8000 auf 7400 Punkte ein. Die Monate davor gab es einen unfassbaren Anstieg von über 30% und das war dann eben die stärkere Korrektur nach unten. Und Peter Lynch spricht jetzt darüber, wie er solche Korrekturen einschätzt. Und es kommt für die meisten wohl eher unerwartet, was er jetzt zu sagen hat. And you know, like any big rally, sometimes it backs off. I mean, it's healthy. In fact, I mean, I'd rather gone down a thousand points than gone to 12,000. If you look at Japan, Japan went from 5,000 to 15,000 on their Dow, and it was fairly priced at 15,000 on earnings and everything else. Mm -hmm. Then it went to 40,000, and that caused seven years of inflated real estate, people overspending, and basically they've been in a recession for five or six years because their market went up too high. I mean, if the market goes up too high. I mean, if, if the market goes too high you're discounting earnings seven, eight, ten years out. There's a so relationship. Everything is overpriced. Yeah, and that doesn't help anything. The market since World War II has sold between 10 times earnings and 20 times earnings. If you look at the Dow Jones or the S&P 500, if you add up all the companies and take the earnings, you say there's a relationship. And it follows. McDonald's earnings have been terrific the last 30 years, and the stock's been terrific. There's a direct relationship. So the earnings of the S&P 500 have been between this range of 10 and 20. We were just about to go over the 20, which is the high end of the PE range. There wasn't a lot of so room left on the PE So PE of 20 is, too, is, is at the it's top peak. of how high it should ever be. Right. It's been over there only a few times ever over 20. And that's yeah. when usually inflation is about zero. In the early 60s, when inflation was about zero, we got a little bit over 20. Now we have a very low inflation rate. So ja, damals lag das Kurs-Gewinn-Verhältnis des gesamten Aktienmarktes, wie Lynn schon gesagt hat, immer zwischen 10 und 20. Aktuell haben wir Kursgewinnverhältnisse in den USA von 18,9, im deutschen Markt von 26,4 und im chinesischen Markt von 31,8. Wir sehen also, dass wir uns in einem hochbewerteten Aktienmarkt befinden. Eine Blase wie zu Dotcom-Zeiten um die 2000er sehe ich aber nicht, denn auch die Zinsen sind auf einem ganz anderen Niveau wie damals. Da sehen wir nämlich seit 40 Jahren den Trend hin zu 0% und das macht alternative Investments wie Aktien deutlich interessanter, wodurch mehr Geld in Aktien fließt und somit die Bewertungen höher sind. If you usually have subtracted inflation from 20, you've had the P of the market. That's been a pretty good ratio. When inflation was 12%, you remember in the early 80s, we had 8 or 9 P of the market. Also Peter Lynch's damalige Formel von der Zahl 20, die aktuelle Inflation abziehen und dann hat man das faire KGV des Aktienmarkts. In den USA haben wir aktuell 5% Inflation, 20 minus 5 macht ein faires KGV von 15. Hier sind wir aktuell bei 18,9, also eine leichte Überbewertung. So Dr. Lynch says all of this has been good for us? Well, it's like I'm a, telling you, it would not have been helpful. It's like a purgative or something. I never thought I'd ever wish for the market to not go up dramatically, but we'll let just... Let's argue the market went to 16,000 tomorrow. Yeah. 
basically, there's earnings behind companies. Okay, but I'm not arguing that. I know that's true. I mean, They're crazy. And, yeah. and stock market I'm price not. ought to be dictated by earnings, and Absolutely. earnings performance and future earnings potential, that's right? right? That's right. I got that. Even I got that. Right. Now, let's just take this for me. Sure. Uh, was the decline yesterday, in a sense, it let off some of this overvaluation. The market right. was even right. overvalued at where it was, right. and by letting it off, right. then we got back to what was reasonable. Well, you know, I would say fairly priced. Maybe for the larger companies, they're now okay. There might be some small companies. I mean, we've had 3,000 companies come public the last four years. That's two a business day. Yeah. Some of those companies have gone down dramatically, and, and that's sort of a research zone that average people in the stock shop, that's what we can find. Some people know a lot about this, 10,000 public companies. A lot of them are very attractive, no one's following them. And there's lots of people following IBM. Well, that's lots how you got following, rich, following companies that nobody else followed. Right. right. I, I'd like to go to see companies with unions or companies in trouble or companies that no one looks Hotels at. Hotels that had nice beds. And, well, yeah, and you have you to know, look at a lot of them. Or pantyhose your wife wore. I remember this story. Oh, okay, you got Pier 1 Imports. My wife <laughs> found that one too. But, <laughs> but you have to look at 20 to find one. It's just you don't you know, go to the mall and find the stock. Also Lynch predigt here wirklich sich über die Aktien zu informieren, bevor man investiert. Pro 20 analysierte Aktien ist eine dabei, die interessant ist. Und er schaut sich eben nicht die bekannten Aktien an, die schon jeder kennt, sondern schaut nach versteckten Perlen, die eher unentdeckt sind. I mean, you have to say, my God, this sounds like it's good. And then you have to do some steps. You have to do an organized method. People are careful when they buy a toaster. Careful, they're careful well, when they buy a seat. They do. They do yeah, some yeah, research. Yeah. But they don't do it with stock. They it's call up the broker or they see somebody at lunch and they say, man, I got this hot stock. Yeah. And you run right out and you spend $5,000, yeah, uh, small yeah. investors. Yeah. Or they, even worse, they put an option in international data whack. They don't even own international data whack. So they have a 90 day play. <laughs> but it's Bill like said casino. it was good and they make a lot of money. Right, right. And it's, a, and it's like a casino. Yeah. So it's like a casino. You get the same results as if there's more paperwork. Right. But yeah. just stay with me in terms of people who are bedazzled by what's happened. Right. If you look at yesterday and you look at today, right. nothing has happened in the fundamentals of economics of right. any company. Right, right. But their well, stock may have gone down well, 10% I, yesterday and up 5 right. today. One modest point, though. I mean, every time you get, you have to get a memory. It's like it gets very cold in the winter in some parts of the country. You get a memory that winter's coming. <laughs> there, okay. Something did really happen in Southeast Asia. I mean, those yeah, are it did. Is those that, economies, was that the cause of what happened in this market? Well, though? I think so. That was the reminder saying, by the word, you know, profits can go down. I mean, there's a downside. But, but why was that the cause? I mean, did, did what's happening in Southeast Asia affect the earnings potential of all these companies it you're did. talking about? Der Moderator Charlie Rose spricht hier über die asiatische Finanzkrise 1997 damals wurden in verschiedenen asiatischen Ländern zu viele Investitionen getätigt und immense Kreditsummen aufgenommen. It did. Because they can't sell their products there? In a small way. No, because those economies have been growing double digit and all of a sudden now they're going because of bank problems, because they're yeah. overfinanced, they're under leveraged. I mean, they're going to have they're going to have to draw their belts. Those part and then people said Wow, maybe that'll become, it'll happen. China is now the fourth largest economy in the world. Ja, damals war China die viertgrößte Volkswirtschaft. Aktuell ist sie schon die zweitgrößte nach den USA und der Trend ist eben ungebrochen. Maybe China can go in recession. So, this sort of woke people, it was like a wake up call saying, whoa, maybe there's a chance earnings can go down. I mean, this is not a big deal for the United States. When Mexico went down, much more important. But it sort of said people. Why well, was it much more important? Well, Mexico much more important much, to Mexico, much Mexico more important much to us. Mexico is much more important to the United States than Thailand is, or the Philippines. Or any, their economy yeah, yeah, is very yeah, important yeah. to us. They're right. a big consumer, very important. They're our neighbor, a lot of people there. Right. That's a very important. When that went down, that affected Latin America was more important. So the, the recession of 1990, but it sort of reminded people. They'd say, wait a second, there is a downside. We have, we've had nine recessions since World War II. We'll have other ones. Tell me what took place overnight between yesterday at the close of market and today at the beginning market. What were the guys that you used to work with saying to each other at Fidelity and what were the people you know right, saying? Right. For example, IBM made a decision right, right. to buy back their stock right, right. and that pre presented some kind of push on the market and their right. stock went up six points. Well, one thing you're trying to do is That's say, of all people. these public companies out there, here's a company I really like. The fundamentals are terrific. Their earnings are doing well. Their competitors are doing poorly. I think this company's doing terrific. And all of a sudden, the stock might have gone from 40 to 30 because of this decline. That would say, wow, here's a chance to buy it. So you're trying to say some companies might have been overpriced at 60, and all they did was go to 50, and you say, big deal. So you're trying to find companies you liked anyway. Right now, you liked them. And now they've had a haircut. Mm -hmm. That's what you would do. You, not, not a stock that went from overpriced to fairly priced. Something that was fairly priced at the start of this exercise, and then had a very, you know, a five for four sale. You know. Sehr wichtig, was Lynch hier anspricht, er versucht Aktien zu finden, die aktuell schon fair bewertet oder unterbewertet sind. Wenn dann eine Korrektur kommt, dann kann er zuschlagen und hat gleich immenses Potenzial. Er schaut also nicht nach Aktien, die überbewertet sind und nach der Korrektur fair bewertet sind, denn dadurch würde er eben Gewinnpotenzial verschenken. Ist natürlich auch leichter gesagt als getan, 
unterbewertete Unternehmen zu finden. Wenn du mehr darüber erfahren möchtest, wie man unterbewertete Unternehmen findet, in der Infokarte findest du ein Video dazu. If you had been managing the Magellan Fund this morning, yes. you would have been buying like crazy? I would have been researching like crazy. I would have been saying, which companies are the same story? Is there anything really happening? This is a non-event for them. They're still doing well. Even if we have a recession, there's nothing to do with them. And, and that's the kind of kinds I would try to buy. But let's say if a company, just think of it, this as being, you say to yourself, I think this company's going to earn something in the future. If it's already discounting that, if it's selling at a huge multiple, you say, it's already, it has to work. And then it's only going to stay even. So you have to say to yourself, if I'm right, how much am I going to make? If I'm wrong, how much am I going to lose? That's the risk-reward ratio. In stock shop, we talk about, if I'm right, I hope I'm going to double trip my money. If I'm wrong, may I lose 30, 40%. That's a favorable ratio. But you say, if I'm right, the stock's not going to go up. It's already discounting terrific things. If discounting terrific things are already in the stock, I don't want to know. Okay, it. so this morning you get up and you go in and you look at, at those companies that, that fit you, that. That you know something about. Right. You have to have an itch. I mean, if you, let's say the cement industry goes from crummy to semi-crummy <laughs> to fairly good. Yeah. The stocks are going north. Right. You're going to make money. That's the industry you know. What if you know the publishing industry? You're, you, some people have, you have an itch. You work. I mean, what if you last 30 years, you worked in the restaurant industry? You would have seen Taco Bell. Right. You would have seen Sabaros. Right. You would have seen Pizza Hut. You would have seen Chili's. You would have seen these companies doing very well. You should have bought those instead of trying to buy biotechnology stocks exactly. you know nothing about. Ja, mit die wichtigste Regel für Peter Lynch, kaufe Aktien von Unternehmen, die du auch verstehst. Gerade wenn die Aktienmärkte heiß gelaufen sind, ist die Regel noch viel, viel wichtiger. Wenn die Märkte nämlich korrigieren und ich weiß nicht, wie es mit dem Geschäftsmodell meiner Aktie aussieht, dann kann es zu Panikverkäufen kommen. Wer das Unternehmen kennt und weiß, das Geschäft läuft reibungslos weiter, auch bei einer Korrektur, der kann mit viel mehr Ruhe und Gelassenheit seine Aktien halten. Und diesen Fehler, Aktien zu kaufen, die man nicht versteht, den sehe ich so häufig, ich zum Beispiel habe keinen Plan von Pharmaunternehmen und lege mir deshalb auch keine Pharmaaktien ins Depot. Es gibt aber Leute, die gefühlt nur das kaufen, was sie nicht verstehen. I mean, I know nothing about local area networking. A lot of people are buying this Cisco. They're buying the equipment, saying, we're going to root together all these peripherals and put together the servers. Well, they, but, but that's not a bad buy because they own a huge percentage of their market. No, but that was, they're saying only a few people have that. They say, my God, if it works for us, other people try it, then colleges will try it, high schools will try it, then they'll go overseas. They knew they were early in the ball game. Right. And they should have been buying that company instead of out buying something they don't know anything about, some oil drilling company. I mean, people have this tendency to always buy something they don't. All, all you right, need is a okay. few. Charlie, all you need is a few good stocks. Yeah, this is your Absolut. Viele Leute haben 50 bis 100 Aktien im Depot, aber um viel Geld mit Aktien zu machen, reichen ein paar gute Entscheidungen, vielleicht 5 bis 10 für das ganze Leben aus. Deswegen lieber bei 5 Aktienentscheidungen mit der größtmöglichen Sorgfalt handeln, als bei 100 Entscheidungen rein aus Emotionen. Man braucht also keine 100 Aktien im Depot, weil dann nehme ich lieber ein ETF, dann habe ich weniger Arbeit damit. Your song. This has been no, your song no, for a long time. No, Only buy what you know. No, but people are waking up in the morning and say this, 5,000 companies out there, which one should I buy? The, the average person ought to be able to follow four or five companies. They ought to be able to lecture on them. They right. understand the companies. And this forces you. This tool says you write down the story. All right, but you keep saying this. The stock shop is what? What is it? This is a CD-ROM that you plug into your CD-ROM right, right. and play through your right. PC and you come up with what? Well, also it's a data stream. You can update information on five or six thousand companies right like that. You can get 10 years of uh, financial data, 10 years of income statements, 10 years of inventory. So you can get updates on all these companies. But that's what you get on a Bloomberg terminal. No, but it's only right now. And you know, it doesn't pick 50 data points. It doesn't go over five years. This, on the companies you want to look at, it'll give you all the information. Out of this? It costs $6.95 a month in addition, and it's a, you get a free oh, trial. I see. I you get a free trial. We okay. get a cut rate deal, and you can also <laughs> buy it. You can get it from Fidelity for special programs. But this yeah. is something, this will help you update it. So you can say, this is a company I want to look at, and I want to see what are the cash looks like. And if you don't understand what cash is, if you don't understand what debt is, I always said, let's say you're looking at companies that are doing poorly. That they're not doing very well. Why don't you buy the one that has $300 million in cash instead of the one that's almost bankrupt? I mean, a lot of companies are selling at $2 or $3 a share. They might be losing $10 well, million. That's a dollars. brainer, isn't it? But people don't do it. And well, they don't this, do it because they don't know how to do the research. Well, this you can look up the balance sheet. Say, listen, they got three million dollars in cash. They're losing ten million a quarter. They'll be okay. Yeah. This other company's got no no cash, seven hundred million dollars in debt. They're yeah. about to blow taps. But, but you also, gerade bei Aktienmärkten am Allzeithoch ist es noch viel wichtiger, das Risiko so gut es geht zu reduzieren. Und hier schaut Lynch auf die Unternehmen, die finanziell stabil sind. Das heißt, geringe Verschuldung, viel Cash und die Möglichkeit, durch diesen Cashpuffer auch Krisen durchzustehen. Telling every small investor in America anyway, they ought to invest in a mutual fund, aren't you? I'm telling you, you can do both. You ought to, you could be investing in mutual funds, and occasionally you should be able to find a stock that's going to make a difference in your life. Unfassbar weise Worte. Peter Lynch spricht hier von einer Art Core Satellite Strategie. Also auf die heutige Zeit übertragen kann man im Kern einen weltweit gestreuten ETF kaufen 
und als Satelliten wählt man Aktien aus, die man versteht und die echtes Potenzial haben. Also Aktien, die lebensverändernd sind und Chancen auf eine Verzehnfachung oder eben auch eine Verhundertfachung haben. Und auch das ist leichter gesagt als getan. Lynch sagt aber auch, dass es diese Möglichkeiten nicht häufig gibt. Wenn sie aber auftreten, dann sollte man seine Hausaufgaben gemacht haben. If it's an industry, you know something about. The industry or local company. I mean, there's a lot of people that said they sell the Kinta Motorins in Texas. They said, my God, it's, I mean, there, a lot of people have seen local companies. So. Friendly's, there's been companies come along no. locally. The people made a St. Jude Medical, made a lot of money for people. Who was that motel you stayed in and then you went and bought a bunch of it? Yeah, La Quinta Motorins. Oh, was that La Quinta? That's yeah, what it was, right. You yeah. stayed overnight there. And, and he said, also got advice from somebody that was a competitor of this. It was a Holiday Inn guy saying, this guy, boy, they're killing us. They're tough, you know. So that way, you get a lot of information. Don't throw yeah. it away. Für Peter Lynch ist es extrem wichtig, die Augen und Ohren immer offen zu haben, wenn man beim eigenen Konsum erkennt, dass eine bestimmte Marke, ein bestimmtes Unternehmen überlegen ist, dann gilt es hier weiter zu graben. Ich schaue mir beispielsweise aktuell die Hello Fresh Aktie an, weil ich die fundamentalen Zahlen attraktiv finde. Ich weiß aber nicht, wie viel Potenzial die Aktie tatsächlich noch nach oben hat. Um das wirklich herauszufinden, habe ich vor, mir die nächsten Tage mal so eine Hello Fresh Box zu bestellen. Und wenn das Produkt wirklich die Konkurrenz abhängt und für mich das Potenzial hat, den Lebensmittelmarkt aufzumischen, irgendwie zu verändern, dann investiere ich auch. Wenn nicht, dann schaue ich eben weiter. Also ich schaue mir selbst an, ob das Produkt oder die Dienstleistung überzeugt, bevor ich dann auch investiere. All right, before you go. Uh, okay. So what, you buy this thing and is it going to charity or not? Everything I've done, all my books and on this, my wife and I could do everything to charity. Is this because you made a bunch of money and so therefore what you do now you want well, to be? That's part of it. I, it's, but also, even if I had made a bunch of money, I'd like to see people do a better job. These are people, I mean, used oh, to... Well. When so you used to your crusade is to influence the investing habits of America? To do, have them do a better job. If they're not ready to do it properly, they shouldn't do it. And, and used to be, you used to be able to retire, and you get half of your last year's salary. Yeah. You'd have a pension. You could rely on that. Now you have to do it for yourself. Some people are presented, they're, but they're let go, or they're early retirement, and they're given $500,000, and they say, this is it. This is your retirement, lady. You've got to take care of it now. And some people have lost all that money in options in the last three months. So what you're saying to people today about the future of the market over the near term is what? What's your feeling? We can take I got to buy business We can about take a coin out and flip it. I have no idea what the next 1,000 points are going to do. The next 6,000 points are going to be up. The next 14,000 points are going to be up. The next 20,000 points are going to be up. But you don't Co know where the next 1,000 is going to be. It Nobody could be does. down, could be up, could Nobody be... Nobody does. And, and it's futile to try and guess it. Ja, hier kommt seine Prognose zum aktuellen Allzeithoch von 1997. Er weiß nicht, wohin die nächsten 1000 Punkte gehen, ob hoch oder runter. Er weiß aber, wo die nächsten 20.000 Punkte hingehen und zwar nach oben. Und wenn wir uns jetzt den Dow Jones ansehen, dann hat er damit Recht behalten. Von knapp 8000 Punkten 1997 stehen wir jetzt bei 33.000 Punkten 2021. Corporate Profits will be a lot higher 10 years from now, they'll be a lot higher 20 years from now. That's what you could rely on. Microsoft didn't exist 20 years ago. Staples didn't exist 20 years ago. Federal Express didn't exist 20 years ago. New companies will come along. That's Cisco what makes Cisco didn't exist 20 years ago. That's what makes Amgen has two one billion dollar drugs. They didn't exist 20 years ago. New companies will come along. That's what makes this country work. You got to keep your eyes open. No. Okay, is the game over in Asia? No, God, no. That, you can't. You know, some of these countries have a 56 percent savings rate. They have a high literacy rate. The game's not over. The, you know, they're going to they're going to have to. But have they lost something? Well, they're going to have to. You know, than some the, of their lending they got carried away. There's, I mean. They're going to have to, you know, step back, figure it out, and go ahead. It's certainly not over in Asia. No way. So emerging markets is still a big deal. Right. Big deal. What about all the criticism of derivatives and the, and the impact they have had? That's a little complicated for me. I, all I know is, I mean, <laughs> I don't know about derivatives. It's for you. It's way over my head. I've never bought an option <laughs> in my life. I never bought I, Time's on your side when you own a stock. You know, I don't know about putting, you know, 3% down and buying a future and a strap and a straddle. That's way over my head. Can't, can't deal with that. <laughs> is that right? Let somebody else deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you're optimistic about the future of the American economy. Earnings potential for right. most well-run companies will do all right. But people have to understand we've had nine recessions since World War II. We'll have other recessions. But we're not in one now. But we may goodness. have one in the future, and don't get worried about it. It will have one. Sometime it will happen, and we'll, no one will tell you when it's going to happen. It's just, well, but won't the fundamentals tell you? No, you'll find out after the fact. You'll, all of a sudden, you'll notice orders slowing, prices get more competitive, then earnings are down. I mean, usually you find out after that. No one declares. Everybody's been saying we're going to have a recession for five years. It just hasn't happened. It's great to see you. Okay, I hope you'll Charlie. come back anytime, Peter. Excellent. Thank Thanks. you Thanks very much. Charlie. 
Jetzt nochmal kurz eine Zusammenfassung der fünf wesentlichen Punkte von Peter Lynch. Erstens, in heiß gelaufenen Märkten fokussiert sich Lynch auf unterbewertete oder fair bewertete Unternehmen. Wenn diese durch einen Crash oder eine Korrektur abstürzen, hat er deutlich mehr Potenzial und die Chance, sein Geld einfach zu verdoppeln oder zu verdreifachen. Zweitens, Lynch versteht das Geschäftsmodell der Unternehmen, in die er investiert. Diese Unternehmen sollten sich vom Wettbewerb unterscheiden und der Konkurrenz überlegen sein, sprich einen Burggraben haben. Drittens, er achtet bei seinen Aktienkäufen auf starke Bilanzen und bevorzugt Unternehmen, die durch ihre Vermögenswerte und Cashbestände mögliche Krisen locker abschütteln können. Viertens, keiner kann vorhersagen, was kurzfristig am Aktienmarkt passieren wird. Es wird also immer wieder Rezession und Crash geben, weil diese unvermeidbar sind. Und fünftens, langfristig werden die Unternehmensgewinne weltweit steigen, weshalb auch die Aktienmärkte langfristig steigen werden. Was hältst du von Peter Lynch und seiner Meinung zum Aktienmarkt, schreib es gerne unten in die Kommentare. Wenn dir das Video gefallen hat, dann zerstör den Like-Button und abonniere diesen Kanal für mehr Tipps und Tricks rund um deine Finanzen. Hier oben rechts findest du das Depot, das ich für meine langfristigen Investitionen in ETFs nutze und hier oben links ein Video, das für dich interessant sein könnte. Vielen Dank dir fürs Zuschauen. Bis zum nächsten Video. Ciao. 